appreciate it. Looks like we got a good group. If you don't know me, my name is Jeff Cook. Uh, I know a lot of you. Some of you I don't know with uh, Yankee Rice from North America. And I'm going to introduce to you really quickly, uh, Mr. Willie Shine, our brand meister in the United States. Mr. Yeah. Right yeah. Yeah. Strap in, it's going to be a fun ride, y'all. Nice one. So, there we go. All right, how's everybody doing? Feeling good? Yeah. You guys ready to get bitter with it? <laughs> You're just coming off some bitter, aren't you? We're gonna, we're, we're, we're gonna turn up and take it bitter style, right? Oh, we're taking it to bitter town. Yeah. So like Jeff said, my name is Willie Shine. I work with Jägermeister. Um, I'm also a uh, drinker with a bartending problem, as I'm sure all of you are as well. How many bartenders in the room? Most of you. Nice, awesome. So bartending for 20 plus years. Um, been in the game for a long time. Worked with multiple brands. Uh, super proud, very happy to be working with this iconic brand, Jagermeister. Um, as you'll see in the next couple of years, especially next year, 2017, new campaign, new style. Um, we're coming out with bigger, bigger, better, faster, stronger. Um, you're going to notice that all we're going to be talking about is provenance, authenticity, process, heritage, everything that Jägermeister hasn't talked about up until this point, right? So everybody in this room, I'm sure, being a bartender for a couple of years or being a bartender for 20 plus like me, as you can see in the gray beard, um, Jägermeister, you know, as, as we all know and love from, from, from years past, is that celebratory shot, or is that ice cold celebratory shot? Whether you have um, feelings one way or another about it, the story's never been told about truly what Jägermeister is. Um, Jägermeister is very similar to being an Amaro from, from Italy, although it's made in Germany. The same process goes into it, the same exact process. And what we're gonna do today, you see a lot of things going on in your map in front of you. Um, we're gonna talk through some things, we're gonna go through some essence of, uh, of different botanicals. You have some dry herbs, you have a couple of different spirits that are Amaro's and Crawford that are in front of you. And what I want to go through today in the next 45 minutes to an hour, I'm going to do my best to get through all this information because it's a ton. And all I've been doing is researching all the way back to as far as the Roman Empire. Um, and you'll see that, you'll see the reason why. Because back then it was a superpower. And around that time, the Mediterranean all the way up into Germany, they were all... Where does this stuff all come from? It comes from medicinal remedies. It comes from monks and, um, and different physicians and alchemists and, and pharmacists way back even before, you know, during the BC, a couple of centuries before, you know, Jesus Christ was even born. They were Jesus Christ, <laughs> sweet superstar. Um, <laughs> Back then, medicine was all about herbs. It was about singular herbs, and it was about recipes of different herbs together. It was all about them trying to find cure-alls that would ultimately, you know, the main goal, which we'll get into, is was for these monks and these pharmacists, these alchemists, and everybody, was to find medicinal properties that would help cure the things that was ailing people, because people were dying very young. And modern medicine happened way later, after the 1500s, 1600s, is when modern medicine kicked in. What we're used to today didn't really even kick in until the 1600s. Previous to that, it was about religion. It was about herbs and spices and flowers. It was about those kinds of things that was, and how they worked on your body and how they made you, how they you know, fixed different things that was going on with you, right? So that's what this is all about. We're gonna take a, a journey and we're gonna go back in time I'm going to sit up here because I have to refer to my notes because this, guys, is the first iteration of this. So thank you for being my inaugural group to, uh, to be here. So I appreciate you all. And I'd also like to say that uh, this is actually my first time in the Tampa area. So I'm super proud to be here. Much love to you guys. So let's kick it off, right? All right, let's have some fun. So, welcome to the DJ Steve tour. Okay, so we're going to take a history.
historic journey and an exploration of the herbal and bitter sector of digestives <coughs> through Italian Mari, German Krauter liquor, with myself, Rand Meister of Jägermeister. Social handles for all of you guys out there at Jägermeister USA. You can also do hashtag DJ Steve or DJ Steve Tour. And I'm at Shine Drinks on the handles if you care to use them. Okay, so here's the mat that's in front of you. Um, as I said, we have some herbal extracts, we have some dried herbs. The first thing that we're going to do here, guys, is the first row, the first five cups. We're going to do. A, we're going to have a little sensory fun, a little sensory quiz. So I only want to do it in a few minutes because we don't have that much time. So the first five of them, I want each one of you. Does everybody have a pen? Okay. So underneath each one of those first five that are closest to you, I want you to smell. Don't taste them because these are tinctures and extracts. They're very high, like. Flavor probably kill your kill your palate. So just use your nose, just smell, and I want you to write down underneath what you think that it is. Okay. So, 
that's just just a quick little quiz to open up the uh, open up your old factory a little bit. You know, these extracts are are, are very important in the um, creation of vermouths and herbal liqueurs. So um, it's a it's a perfect way to start. So thank you for doing that. Okay. Oops. Using two computers here. So, all right. So we're gonna at this point let's let's um, talk a little bit of history. We're gonna set the stage. Okay. So guys, um, bear with me. This is gonna be a, a ton of information. And I've tried to like bring it down as much as I can, but I, I, I really want to like take this back to a point that in the end it really makes sense. Okay. So um, let's go. So. With, you, you, can't really, you can't really talk about any type of herbal liqueur or vermouth or anything of the like within the category without going as far back as the Silk Road, okay? So the Silk Road, guys, was from 200 BC to 1400 AD. It wasn't a road, it was a bunch of trade routes, okay? It didn't begin the trade, trade routes, but it expanded the scope of it. It changed the world of Africa and Eurasia um, and uh, the, the Silk Roads went from all the way from China all the way to the uh, Western Mediterranean, not only by land, but also by sea. Uh, this was the original route that's all by land, and as you can see, it goes all the way from China all the way up to, ultimately, it gets to Rome, uh, and, which is a very important point, which we'll get to momentarily. Uh, in between, you know, all that land between China and and all the way to the uh, eastern part of, or eastern western part of the uh, Mediterranean. There had to be people that kind of, you know, we had the nomadic tribes, nomadic people, the people that like helped, you know, make these this trade happen, right? The traders, the merchants, all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, one of the people were the Mongols. And the Mongols were a big part of this because they were the ones who started using camels um, instead of donkeys. Um, and why is that important? Because camels at that time actually worked faster, they needed less uh, to eat and drink, and they could carry more on their backs. So the fact that the Mongols started using camels really pushed the Silk Road forward in, the, in this time frame um, and helped you know, bring all types of luxuries and different things throughout the, uh, the, the world at that time. Um, so, some of the things were from China, it came, what, what, what came from China was like jade, silver, iron. From India, it was fine cotton, textiles. East Africa was ivory. And from Arabia, it was spices and incense. So some of the effects of the Silk Road as well, um, a bunch of cities popped up, and one of them um, was called Palmyra. And Palmyra was a city that, uh, that grew very big, that ultimately was uh, built with a lot of architecture, like from the Roman Empire, uh, with a lot of Romanism, and uh, ultimately due to the fact that there was so much market, so much trade, so much stuff happening on the Silk Road, this is why these cities were popping up, and Palmyra was one of them. Um, the rich during this time, during the Silk Road, uh, of course, were affected due to the fact that they got a lot more luxuries. Uh, the poor was affected due to the fact that they had a lot more jobs. Um, what else went along the Silk Road was religion, especially Buddhism, was spread along the Silk Road. The Silk Road. Uh, merchants and traders became supporters of monasteries along the Silk Road. And why? Because they were places that they could stop and get. Uh, they, they were like there was were like hospitals at the time and like bed and breakfasts of the time. Um, it's where the, the traders and merchants and the monasteries really worked hand in hand at the time uh, for a lot of different reasons. But then ultimately the Silk Road. Uh, sent um, a lot of plague and disease and that kind of thing. So later on, during the Middle Ages, like after the Roman Empire, during the Holy Roman Empire in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, this is when we saw millions and millions of people die due to plague and that kind of thing. And that was because of, uh, you know, the silver itself. So, um, so a lot of good things, but also ultimately not so good. But we'll get to why uh, in a second. Okay, so this is uh, trade routes and all roads lead to Rome. Has anybody heard that, that saying before? All roads lead to Rome? It's a, it's a pretty popular, popular statement or popular saying. And in actuality, it really means something. 
So the Roman Empire was during 200 BC to about 400 AD, okay? And the Roman Empire was the, really the greatest importer of, of the time in all of the roads, all of the, they actually built roads, and we'll talk about that in, in a second, but they actually built paved roads uh, for all of the traders ultimately to get to their, to get to Rome in particularly. Uh, it was a very grand, glorious marketplace in Rome. Um, the Romans really relied on trade from China to the British Isles. Uh, they were the finest connoisseurs of luxurious commodities. Rome had a grand marketplace with luxuries for sale from all over the world. The nomads, traders, and merchants came by land and by sea, as I said. Uh, the biggest ports in the Mediterranean back then were Spain, France, and the Middle East. Um, and ultimately, like I was saying, they, you know, they built these they built these amazing roads. Like these Romans were very, you know, innovative and, and, and incredible because there was so many people, and they had they they were the superpower of the time, which we'll talk about more. And they also during you know as as ships were traveling from port to port, they also had lighthouses that would help them um, for safe journey. And back there, I mean, think about this, 200 BC to 400 AD, they had boats the size of tankers that were literally the size of tankers we know today that would hold up to like 3,000, uh, they were called amphoras. Now, anybody know what an amphora is? An amphora being like a, a clay you know, jug that they used to like house wine and other things in. So these boats were so huge that they could bring two to 3,000 of those things from port to port. <clears throat> they also had, you know, things like, um, unfortunately, slaves of the time. That was a big thing at the, at the time. Um, they would, they would, it, there was marble, papyrus, fur, linen, silk, spices, perfumes, olive oils, pottery, all kinds of stuff that would go all throughout this, all throughout this area. Um, and what did the Romans trade with? The Romans traded with the Romanism. So Romanism being like, you know, you think about what what is Rome to you guys when you think about Rome? You think about, you know, the architecture, right? Or the gladiators and Latin Latin language and you know lavish lifestyles and that kind of stuff, right? Is everybody with me on that? Plumbing. So that's plumbing, irrigation, plumbing, irrigation, sewerage, brothels, all kinds, of, all kinds of great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, if you can see it, this is at an actual, um, at, at its biggest, um, that's, that's what it looked like. So Gaul, Spain, borders of Africa there, Italy, Greece, Syria, Egypt, into Asia, all the way up to Germany. Um, 65 million people at that point. So this is the Roman Empire. We can't discuss anything beverage without taking a bit we're talking a bit about this area of time, its magnitude and its behaviors. So the Roman Empire, as you can see, like you said, was uh, 65 million people. Uh, Rome was the epicenter of it. Can everybody see where Rome is? Right here. That was the epicenter of this whole, of this whole area. And it was a superpower of the time, as I said before. It covered over two million square miles. Um, at 146 BC, it owned most of the Mediterranean. At 106 AD, expansion ended as it hit ocean and as it hit desert. They didn't expand anymore uh, where they couldn't grow olives or, wine, or grapes for wine. So talking about what, uh, what summer, what you were just saying. So they were innovators, they were inventors, um, the Romans uh, were very big in, in, in innovating and in, in, in expanding, you know, their, all these things. So you'll see here, that top left is an aqueduct. So in Rome, where there was one million people living, each one at the peak of the Roman Empire had like three to four gallons of fresh water a day, Amazing. which was a lot. It's a lot. That's a lot of fresh water for that time, because water at that time was super contaminated. Right? That's why they drink a shit ton of beer and a shit ton of wine. And we'll get into that too. Uh, the top right is, a, is an old bathroom. Um, this is you know they were so ahead of the time as far as like taking care of um, you know sewerage and, and, and all that stuff. These were the roads that they would pave. 
right? Roads all over Italy, all over the Roman Empire, so traders and soldiers can ultimately make their way back to Rome. And then, of course, cathedrals. Um, and bathhouses and grand theaters and like I said brothels and temples and coliseums all kinds of stuff so and again we're just setting the stage right now to, to get to the point of, uh, of this whole thing these guys are the three great ancient teachers of medicine okay um, one is from Rome one is from Persia one is from Greece Galen is a Roman Avicenna is from Persia and Hippocrates is from Greek. This so is Greek from Greece. Anybody heard of Hippocrates before? Right. So he was a Greek physician, and he's is considered one of the most outstanding figures in the history of medicine. He is referred to as the father of modern medicine. Hippocrates is credited with being the first person to believe that diseases were caused naturally, not because of superstition and gods. He separated the discipline of medicine from religion, believing and arguing that, the, that disease was not a punishment inflicted by the gods, but rather the product of environmental factors, diet, and living habits. So literally, you know, modern medicine, it goes back to this, this day and age of what of, of Hippocrates. So Galen, who we'll talk more about too, is he, he came around in the late 100s, first century AD. And he built on the early idea, ideas of Hippocrates, that illness was the result of an imbalance of the body. Gallen's early interest in wine, and we start talking about beverage, was as young as a young doctor, he treated dis and disinfected gladiators wounds with it. Because back then, water was so contaminated. If you poured water on a wound, it would just, it would get so bad, and you would die from it. So they would use beer and wine as, as, as medicine to pour on wounds. Uh, because of the, the alcohol in it, and it, and it helped, uh, helped clean the wounds. He was also the personal physician of Marcus Aurelius. You've heard of Marcus Aurelius, right? Yeah. Uh, best known for his universal antidote and daily medicine for the king for the prevention of poisoning and overall illness. First introduced by a guy named Mith Mithridates, uh, first century BCE, Gallant's cure Cure-all contains 71 ingredients, including ground-up lizards, poppy juice, spices, incense, juniper berries, ginger, hemlock seeds, raisins, fennel, aniseed, and licorice. So, I mean, there was 70, 71 of them, but that was some of it. And this king would drink that every single day. But in order to wash that down because it was so nasty, Gallen was, would prescribe Marcus Aurelius only the best vintage of wine. Right? And so, what was the best vintage of wine? It was wine that was ancient, it was old wine, that still had its sweetness, that didn't have any bitter to it. So that's how they considered their best, the best vintages of the time. And Gallen would not give anything else but the best to the king. And, you know, it's funny because you think about the 71 ingredients, it goes into the antidote. It's pretty nasty. You better get something good, right? <laughs> and then you have uh, Avicenna, who was a Persian polymath. Who, which means he was a writer and a philosopher and good at everything, um, who was regarded as one of the most significant thinkers and writers of the ancient times with over 400 works dedicated to philosophy and medicine. Has anybody heard of the word panacea before? Mm -hmm. So panacea uh, was also a Greek god, she was the Greek goddess of universal medicine, and panacea is, uh, as we talk through all this history, each one of these guys, whether that be Galen, uh, Avicenna or Hippocrates, and, and even going into alchemists and going into you know pharmacists and, and everybody as we go through time, everybody was trying to find the panacea, which was the cure all, which was the the one herbal remedy with everything in it that would just cure everything that was wrong with you, that would further your life and just cure everything. That's what a panacea is, and that's what that from the beginning was what everybody was trying to accomplish. <laughs> I love this picture. Um, so let's talk a little bit now going to the alcohol consumption in the Roman Empire. So beer was brewed, but wine was definitely the drink of choice. Wine was designated into classes, um, which was interesting. So it was typically drank civilized by adding water as well. So it was in classes, but it was also everybody added water to it. No matter if you were the rich all the way down to slaves, if you could, you added water to it. Um, but the rich, the first class, 
They were given the best wine, the best vintages, nothing that was going bad, they had the best of the best. The middle class, the second class, they, uh, they got wine that was starting to go bad, okay? But here's an interesting point. The middle class in the Roman Empire would carry around with them spice bags and other flavorings in order to pr improve the flavor of the wine. What, does this sound familiar to anybody? This is the beginning. This is the beginning of vermouth. This is the beginning of, um, you know, of, of Croucher liquor, of Amari, of all of it. This is, this is, this is the start was, you know, these, these ancient physicians as well as the middle class Roman Empire carrying around these spice bags to make bad wine taste better, okay? The slaves, the third class of wine, uh, they just got wine that was completely bad, that went bad. It was wine that was either, that either was completely turned or was also wine that was fermented off of the pumice, which ultimately ended up becoming a really delicious thing, which is grappa. Very nice. <clears throat> so some may turn their nose at using, you know, things, putting things into wine, but how different is how different is that than, you know, adding flavor from oak, or how different is that from adding, you know, botanicals to it that ultimately now is removed in, in fortified wines, right? So back in the day, there was also um, a, a certain type of uh, wine mixture, right? That was it was called Muslim. And this was a wine sweetened with honey that showed up in the first century. And there was also a um, wine called Rosatan, which was a similar drink flavored with roses. So this might be, again, the beginning of, of, of what we're talking about. What was the honey wine called again? Muslim, like M-U-S-L-I-M. And the, uh, the second one is called Rosatan. So I, I, I may be not um, using the proper enunciation of it, but it's M-U-S-L-I-M. And then Rosa, like R O S A T E M, Rosatum. Uh, so these were these were you know common drinks of the time. Herbs and honey and other additives were were more commonly added to lesser wines to con conceal their imperfections, right? Okay, so after the Roman Empire, so the post the fall of the mighty Roman Empire was the Holy Roman Empire and the Middle Ages. The beginning of the Middle Ages uh, to 1806, the Kingdom of Germania, Germany as you see there, Germania at the time, uh, was the biggest kingdom during this time. It included Italy, Bohemia, and Burgundy. Monks and the hundreds of monasteries, if not thousands of monasteries at this time contained all of the books and knowledge of herbal medicines, wine, and beer production. Healing or medicines during this period was usually left up to religious beliefs, as I was as I spoke to at the beginning. You know, there were more than half of the population, I'd say three quarters of that population, was really all about religion and, 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 and praying to their God in order to heal them. But ultimately the the monks um, were the ones who studied and and had all of these you know, herbs and, and botanicals and really understood what each one of them was doing to the human body and ultimately helped you know, make life longer at the time. There's a woman which we'll talk a little bit more about. Her name is Hildegard of, of, uh, of Bingen. Um, she was a Benedictine abbess who in the 11th century was an expert on illness and remedies. Uh, she lived in Germania. She opened up a couple of, uh, of monasteries at the time, um, but she had one word of advice for everybody around that time. Drink more beer. It was really funny. She's like, the reason why, if you look up or, or, or do any, any um, research on beer in Germany or the area, it goes back to, the, to Hildegard because back then, like I said, the water was so contaminated that everybody drank beer. So whether you were a child up to an adult or whatever, it was like everybody drank tons of beer. And, um, I think if I remember correctly, it was somewhere around was that? like 50 liters, 50 liters of beer per person per year at the time. It's a lot. We could do that a week, right? <laughs> <laughs> so until the 20th century, water was contaminated, so children and adults drank tons of beer, as you said. Um, Talking a little bit about abbeys, monasteries, nuns, and monks. 
So abbeys and monasteries, some like hilltop fortresses, others surrounded by high walls, were places of science, learning, and culture in the Middle Ages. The importance of these impressive stone monu monuments is still palatable today. Uh, wine and beer were used to infuse medicinal plants to help with many ailments along the Silk Road, as we discussed, and throughout the Roman Empire and into the Holy Roman Empire. The monks and nuns were the ones who held the key to the medic medicines during this time. If the trade routes, if the trade routes were the ancient internet, right, then the monasteries were the computers of the time. Does that make sense to you guys? Literally, all those trade routes, all those roads, all those, you know, the Silk Road and the routes on the sea, by land, everything, all of the knowledge, all of the information, all of the, all of that stuff was really harnessed by the monks in the monasteries. There were so many, thousands, all over, all over the, uh, the Roman Empire and, and beyond. Most of the monasteries back then had also taken the sick and dying to tend to them, because those were, back in the day, those were the hospitals of the time. This is uh, Hildegard of Bingen. Um, she was born in 1098. Um, as I said, she was a German Benedictine abbot. She was a writer, a composer, a philosopher. She is considered to be the founder of the scientific natural history um, in Germany. She founded two monasteries. Um, and what, what's so important about her is once you start learning and studying about, you know, Amari and Krauter Licker, it really, a lot of it goes back to some of her works. Um, she wrote a couple of books. One was called The Physica, and the other was called The Cause Curie. And the first one, Physica, was a medicinal book, um, a medical book that uh, talked about the properties of various plants, stones, fish, reptiles, and animals. And the second book, uh, was the explanation of the human body and how plants and uh, herbs and spices, roots, flowers, all that, how it, how it worked on the human body. And also antidotes and cures of different diseases. Um, both of these books are historically significant as they show areas of medicinal, or sorry, medieval medicine that were not well documented because their practitioners, mainly women, rarely wrote in Latin. So she's a, she was a badass at the time. It's pretty cool. So distillation. So we've now gone through the time period in, of, of uh, the Roman Empire into the Holy Roman Empire. During this time, it was all about beer and wine. Beer and wine drinking, beer and wine as medicine, the infusions of beer and wine uh, to, to you know, help everything that ailed you. And now it's the time where distillation happens, right? So whether you know or not, um, actually distillation was starting to be discussed all the way as far back as Aristotle, uh, 384 BC to 322 BC, where he mentioned that the distillation or the boiling of salt water wasn't salty. So it goes as far back as that. Um, in Alexand Alexandria, Egypt, the remnants of a guild of perfumers was found. Uh, first centuries BC and AD, they used stills to distill elixirs. Earliest groups to be found working in the field of chemistry and alchemy. Uh, Greeks and Romans were totally knowledgeable about this technique because of Aristotle. Uh, later, thanks to the Arab world by the 8th century, an Arab scholar by the name of Jabir Hayyan, who is remembered as one of the fathers of chemistry, he devised and improved a form of distillation um, in the apparatus or the still, uh, with which he and other alchemists distilled wine and other substances for their experiments. Close to the first millennium, so now we're talking about you know, uh, you know, eight, first millennium A.D. The most cultured city back then was called Cordoba, <coughs> the capital of the Arab uh, Arab world, uh, which is now southern Spain. Uh, Arab scholars of the time uh, from this area were building on Greek and Indian and Persian sources to make further advances in mathematics, medicine, and philosophy. They pioneered the use of herbs and anesthetics, amongst many other things, as well as they refined and popularized the art of distillation. Arab scholars who first distilled wine regarded the result as a medicine rather than an everyday drink. So only when knowledge of distillation spread into Christian Europe did distilled spirits become more widely consumed. 
and wine was widely used as a medicine for a long time. So it was only natural that the more concentrated and purified wine should have even more greater, greater healing, healing powers. So in 1122 AD in Salerno, Italy, was the focal point of distillation for the medicine. It was a port city that would see herbs and spices from around the world. Monks helped keep the manuscripts of distillation alive during the Dark Ages. And distillation spread from Italy through the southern grape growing regions and eventually through the rest of Europe. The spread of distillation was assisted by the invention of the printing press in the 1440s by uh, the German, by a German man by the name of uh, Johannes Gutenberg, and in 1500, Harmonius Brunschweig, an Alsatian physician, published the Liber de Art Distillande, the Book of Art of Distillation, describes the book as the mistress to all medicine. Names like life water have continued to be the inspiration for the names of several types of beverages, like Gaelic whiskey, French eau de vie, possibly vodka. Also, Scandinavian aquavit spirits get its name from the Latin phrase of aquavite. <coughs> okay, so we can't talk. We can't really talk about. Um, you have to talk about vermouth before you can talk about Kranto liquor or amari, because previous to distillation. This is where vermouth came from, right? So vermouth originated as a medicinal wine, as we talked about. The herbs and botanicals believed to cure scores of ailments. The emperor of the Shang Dynasty drank a glass every day. Um, Indian healers used it in their traditions. The Greeks were so enamored by it that they concocted hundreds of different herb-infused white wines. By the time this mystical, mythical, mystical drink made it to the Roman Empire, the greatest minds in the world set their sights on improving their admittedly schwag wine. Vermouth is a fortified and aromatized wine, as we know. Wine spiked with brandy, infused with herbs and spices, and sweetened. There are two main varieties, as we know, red, sweet, vermouth, uh, which originally hails from Italy, and white, dry vermouth, which first appeared in France, uh, which, if, you know, if, if, I think a lot of you here are classic style bartenders. You know that if you read like Jerry Thomas's book and all the old books, you see, you know, dry, French dry Italian wine. The name vermouth is the French pronunciation of the German word wormut, which means wormwood. That has been used as an ingredient in the drink over its history. Fortified wines containing wormwood as a principal ingredient exist in Germany. Existed in Germany around the 16th century. At about this time, an Italian merchant named D'Alessio began producing a similar product in Piedmont as a wormwood wine. And then going back to Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine is likely also the father of vermouth. What Hippocrates would serve his patient, patients was quite possibly the earliest, earliest form of vermouth. Prescribed from everything from jaundice to menstrual pains, vermouth was believed to aid many illness and was also commonly used as an antidote against poisonous mushrooms and hemlock. Vermouth is a German creation stemming from the language's word of wormwood and vermouth, and the country's historical wormwood-infused wines. Geographically, vermouth as we know it today is decidedly an Italian and French invention from the 18th century kingdom of Sardinia. The region was the first to take the ancient concept of mixing wine with herbs and market it to the commercial population. They wanted both to give the local wine a different flavor profile and also to infuse medicinal herbs into a tonic. During, during the final decades of the 18th century, there was a very popular trend in Europe for creating new and different aperitifs, aiming towards the most unusual blends of wines, alcohols, herbs, and other ingredients. This phenomenon spanned the center of Europe, southern Germany, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and northern Italy. The first commercial and modern vermouths were packed and in Turin and Milan, which became the home of this drink and in the 18th century. Up here on the left hand side, that's a picture of what wormwood looks like when it's in plant form. And over there on the right is a, uh, as you see, a map of the area of where vermouth, uh, modern vermouth, was made popularized and commercialized. Really? Yeah. This cocktail. The first one or the second one? Both. The first cocktail is a variation on a spritz. 
Okay, we're going to call it Spritz 56. So it's uh, it's Jägermeister lemon juice, uh, a little bit of simple uh, with Prosecco. So very nice aperitif, easy drinking. This next one is a um, it's a Negroni build, but I'm a um, I'm a purist and I would never call it a Negroni. So it's called the uh, um, Count Mass cocktail. Um, so it's uh, equal parts of um, there's no Campari in it, so there's equal parts um, Dagermeister, sweet vermouth, and gin. Um, so enjoy. All right, now let's get into, so that's setting the stage, right? So what did we go over? We went over a lot of history there and a lot of, a lot of information, right? So it's all about, you know, pre-distillation, um, post-distillation is where we're going into now, but really, you know, kind of, you know, the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, all that area is where everything came from in this, as far as Amaro's and Crafton Makers and the like, and Vermouths, okay? So let's now go into a little bit of pre-distillation, post-distillation, okay? Can everybody read that? Kind of, sort of. Okay, the first one uh, says, beer, grape, rice, wine, and mead. That was kind of the beginning. Then you have medicinal herbal remedies and antidotes, which then turned into wine and beer as medicines and social drinking. Wine and beer based herbal remedies and also sweetened and not sweetened. And ultimately in the 1100s AD was where distillation happened and began uh, Water of Life Aqua Vitae. And off of that spawned Aramari, Crocodile Liquor, Bitters, um, Herbal Liquors, Liqueurs, Spirits, Next slide is um, just really based on liqueur or liqueur styles. So uh, before distillation, you had the herbal and sweet enhanced wines. Uh, hit distillation and comes out medicinal um, spirits and aquavite, which then in turn adds sugar, honey, or anything. And you have Amari, Crocodile Liquors, and liqueurs. The next slide is comparisons of Crowder liquor to Amari. Um, you know, Crowder liquor is the German version of what Amari is. So if we're thinking with our modern minds, Amari and Amaro is Italian. Germany, it's Crowder liquor. It's a very difficult category because you have brands here in the US you have that are, that are coming out with Amaro. So you have uh, a beautiful, you know, Angostura from Trinidad that came out with an Amaro that's very delicious. You have, but if you talk to Italians, all they're trying to do is create a, a like a, what is it, a DOM or a, they're trying to make sure that Amaro stays Italian, right? Um, but it, like I just set the stage, you know, back in the Roman Empire and beyond, all that area was one area. So historically, where all this stuff came from, is from the same place. It just so happens that in modern time, we have Germany, we have Italy, we have you know all these other countries around it, where Bekarova is from, where Unicom is from. You know, uh, they're they're all from the same place. They're all a similar thing. So it's an it's an herbal liqueur, an herbal bitters, right? So underneath that would be, in my opinion, Crocodile liquor and Amari. But the but the umbrella of the categories herbal bitters and liqueurs. Does that make sense to everybody? So I don't listen, this is like this category of, 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 of spirits of liqueurs is, is a is a very rogue one and a very large one. And it's like you're gonna go down a rabbit hole like I am at this point of, of trying to understand um, each country's designation, law, sugar content, ABV and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, if you take it back to history and historical value of where it all comes from, that's that's where that's where the sweet spot is in my opinion. Because nowadays, you know, each country has their own provenance and that kind of thing, but historically it all comes from the same place. So that's that's all I'm trying to get across within the seminar. We'll talk more about it. Is everybody following me with following me with that? Cool. So Crocker Liquor Amari, one's German, one's Italian. They're both herbal bitter, herbal liqueurs. Some have some have a lot of sugar, some don't. But here's something funny in Germany. There is a law and a designation that if you have above 100 grams per liter, 
the whole European Union, 100 grams per liter, you're a liqueur. Under 100 grams per liter, you're not a liqueur. That's, that is a law in the European Union. But in, if you're a bitter herbal liqueur in Germany, and you have over 100 grams per liter, you're a half bitter. This is the only country in the world that calls it a half bitter. Under 100 grams per liter, it's called a bitter. In Italy, they don't have that. But, how, I mean, everybody here has had multiple types of Amaros, right? Okay. And under the term Amaro or Amari, there's all different, all different flavor profiles and styles, right? But at the end of the day, when we talk about, and I was just in Italy, and I, was, I had a master class with this amazing guy that I'll mention his name momentarily, um, and I, I spent some time traveling in northern Italy, but in Italy, bitters, when they say bitters, bitters, that's Campari, that's aperitif, that's, um, forget the name of it, it's either yellow or red, that's how they designate it. Amaro Amari is more herbal, dark and brown, right? So that's the Italian take on it. And it could be, it could have a ton of sugar, it could have not much sugar. It could be like we're gonna taste one today that has a good amount of sugar in it, it's a liqueur, or it could be like you tasted Frenet Branca, right? I think Frenet Branca has 30, 30 grams of sugar, 20 grams of sugar? Anybody here from Frenet Branca? 130 calories an ounce. 130 calories an ounce, but like 20, you know, 20 grams of sugar. <laughs> it's like a Guinness. <laughs> My point is, this is a great time for us as bartenders and as people in our craft um, and beyond. You know, bitter is 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 has a there's a big movement, right? Big movement of bitter right now. Five years ago, were you guys drinking bitter? Ten years ago, some of you been drinking bitter. I mean, ten. I mean, shit. Ten years ago, I've been drinking bitter my whole life. Shit. No, but I mean, listen. Bitter right now is, 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 is a huge, huge movement. And if we're in the front lines as bartenders, our guests are starting to get advanced palates. They're starting to be educated. They're starting to want to know where things are from, what the provenance is. They're, trying, they're starting to drink more bitter than they are sweet. So this is a great moment for all Amaro, all Crowder, all of us. It's a, you know, whatever that, whatever that, um, that saying is, boat, all, all boats rise at the tide. I mean, in my opinion, all of the, all of the bitter, you know, um, friends and competitors, whatever, all of us working together is a good thing, right? In my opinion. All right, so that's, those are the, those are the commonalities and, and slight differences, but they're very much the same. So, <clears throat> I met this guy in Germany, uh, I'm sorry, in, in Italy, um, his name is Fulvio Puccinino. Anybody heard of Fulvio Puccinino? No? So this guy is pretty much the godfather of Amaro and pharmacy and all that kind of stuff as far as historic value. And he said to me, he said, I spent four hours with him in a master class at the Campari headquarters at HQ. And he said to me, he said, Willie, you can historically break down Italy in two ways, northern and southern. Mountain medicinal herbs up north, citrus, herbal down, down, down south because, but nowadays in the modern take, of course, you know, herbs and spices you can get anywhere and you can, you know, the modern, the more modern styles, it doesn't really fall into that category, but historically, this is where it came from. The, the alpine balsamic medicinal pharmacy style herbs uh, into Amaro's was north and the more orange citrus was south, okay? So a little bit of uh, Italy, you have your Amaris, which ultimately bitter herbal digestivos, you have liqueurs, which are your like maraschinos and uh, amarettos, that kind of thing. You have your bitters, like we talked about, aperitivo, campari, aperol. You have grappa, you have brandies that are grape-based, and you have uh, fruit-based. In Germany, up north, it's all, it's all grain usually, which is called corn. Down south is all roots and fruits. So as you get closer to Austria and Switzerland, there's an area called the, um, the Black Forest. In Odevis and Schnapps of this area is all about, or Schnapps actually there is, is an Odevis, it's fruit-based brandy. Um, so everything, kind of like when you learn about tequila, 
and mezcal is the is the umbrella. Germany, the umbrella category is schnapps. Everything is schnapps there. Here in the U.S., schnapps is what Dr. McGillicuddy's, you know, <laughs> you know, like really bad, like overly sugared, terrible stuff. But in Germany, you know, corn, which is their version of, of grain vodka, is is a schnapps. Uh, there's double corn, which is a twice distilled. There's Kirsch, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, which is from cherries, fermented and, and distilled cherries. Obstler, apple pear, burn is pear, and you can see down the line. I know I'm running out of time, but um, I want to get to tasting here real quick. Um, and okay, of course, let's you know, aperitif and digestif. This gets thrown around like like crazily. Let's just keep it simple, right? Proof and sugar content. Aperitivo, before, low sugar, low proof. Digestivo, after, high proof, sometimes higher sugar. But sometimes they're one and the same. Us making cocktails, you can take a high proof and make a spritz out of it, and then ultimately, ultimately it's what? It's an aperitivo, right? So this is just little rules of thumb, but ultimately sometimes they're one and the same. Potable, non-potable. A lot of people talk about potable, non-potable bitters, right? So potable is ones that you that we typically drink, right? Amaros, Crouchers, that kind of thing. Non-potable are your aromatized, or sorry, your uh, cocktail bitters, like Angostura, Peixas, Bitter Truth. I'll skip down to, unless you're enjoying a Trinidad Sour from Mr. Giuseppe Gonzalez at Suffolk Arms. Because then you're drinking two ounces of Angostura peppers in the cocktail. <laughs> and it's fucking delicious if you haven't had it. Um, so, Let's get into the tasting real quick, guys. So the spices that are on the map are, you have clove, and a lot of the, the, these, these five, six spices here are some of the spices that go into making Jägermeister. Okay, so you have, let me just catch up. You have clove, uh, which the best ones you can find in Madagascar and Tanzania. Um, soothe and relax the inner linings of your intestines, aiding in digestion, it has all that stuff. Um, star anise, which is the second one. Vietnam and China is where you typically find the best. Um, it's responsible for some of the sweetness in Jägermeister, not just sugar. FYI, sugar only has 140 grams per liter, so it's actually very low in sugar. It's just the um, some of the herbal um, notes that are in there that kind of push sugar forward, which was actually used in a lot of the pharmacy, pharmacist, like alchemy back in the day when they're, when it tasted like shit, they would add sugar to it. So that you, or sorry, they would add star anise, fennel, licorice, that kind of thing. So it actually has historic value. I was just about to know, I said, how many calories does it have? It's, it's not much more than, uh, than, than his, what he said. It's around 150 per ounce, something like that. I mean, it's, I mean it, it's, a, it's a liqueur, guys, you know? I mean. So, bitter orange, um, which is one of them there. Uh, cinnamon from Sri Lanka. Uh, Chiretta, which is one of the bittering agents that go in it. Some of the other bitter, bitter stuff is, of course, wormwood, chinchona, um, gentian, things like that. Uh, we got ginger in there, you smell. And guys, there's one that's a milled spices. Everybody pick up the milled spices. <coughs> This is literally the 56 herbs and spices that go into Jägermeister, all milled down. Does it smell like Jägermeister? Yes. Yeah. It does, right? <laughs> and there's no sugar in there, but it smells sweet, right? How many calories are in this unit? <laughs> what if I rub it on your... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, and then the next thing I want you to do is, um, underneath those spices is a little spoon. That spoon is the base of Jägermeister. So the process of making Jägermeister and a lot of Amaros and crop liquors <coughs> is we bring in all of the spices and, and dry, right? Some people, some people hire perfume companies, some people hire extract companies, that kind of thing. Jägermeister and some others, we bring in our own and we create our own extracts, okay? 56 herbs and spices, they're broken into four different macerates. Um, and you know, broken down by by flower by type, right? So all the roots go together because roots are very strong and hard, and they, they you know, if you if you mix roots with botanical flowers, ultimately you won't get the best extraction because some take longer than others, right? So and some take higher proof alcohol and some take lower proof alcohol. So ultimately, it's broken into four macerates over 30, 34 days or so. 
um, under alcohol and water, we extract those flavors from the dried herbs that are all within that mill. And then ultimately it goes into a uh, oak cask, Slovenian oak cask, which is fairly typical to the style. Um, and it sits in there for a year. And we're not imparting any flavor profile onto it. It's just sitting there to rest. And it's, done this, it's been done the same way from the beginning. It, there's nothing changed, right? It's been the same way since 1934. So what you're tasting there is what is then com what is what comes out of the cask, what comes out of that oak cask after a year. So that's the base of Jägermeister, right? So next steps after that are to add sugar, to add caramel, to add uh, water to bring it down to dilution, and then bottle and go. Okay. We're all educated people here. We've been through a lot of educational categories of uh, different spirits. Caramel sometimes is a dirty word. In this category, Amaro's, Crowder Liquors, caramel is part of the ingredients in that it actually adds some of the bitter um, and burnt toasted flavors that you get. So how many people have ever had, how many people have ever had a creme brulee before? You burn the sugar on top of it, that's the flavor profile that you get off of caramel that goes into it. Somebody had a question? I was going to say, so we're talking caramel and flavor, not in color. Correct. That is exactly right. Burnt sugar. Um, okay, so let's get into doing some tasting. Let's bust it out real quick. I know everybody's running out of time here or whatever, but the way that I want to do this is, okay, how to taste like a pro, always smell and evaluate first, always taste twice, the first gets in your mouth ready. Move your liquid around your mouth and, and over your gums. Breathe, breathe through your nose and your mouth open slightly. Allow the aromas to cross over your palate. Um, you are all good tasters. It's just a repetition um, to get to really good at it. And ultimately, we're drinking bitter here, so uh, keep an open mind, okay? So the first thing I want to try is, um, let's see, we're going we're gonna to start over in Amari, okay? And we're going to start with the number two. Okay, so um, smell it, evaluate it, drink it. Your own everything that I just said. If anybody's never tasted before, follow those rules. If you've tasted before and you have your own way of doing it, do it. So this is an open discussion too. You guys can call out what you're smelling, what you're tasting. We're just doing one two and then one two, or how do you like? I think we're going to start with this one, and I'm going to show you what it is. Smoke, rhubarb. What else? Number two. Number two over in Amari we're tasting. Tannin, some honey, some, some bitter. Bitter's not like in the front, it's in the end, right? Citrus. But the bitter's pretty, pretty prominent. I mean, I get like chamomile. What about anybody else? So I had the, uh, I had the ability and the, and the blessing to be able to go visit Braulio. Yes. And why I love, why I love Braulio so much is it's very similar to Jägermeister. Is it's a family-owned brand. Although Averna bought it at one point and now Campari owns it, but it's still run by the family. Uh, the great grandfather that started it was actually a pharmacist and a chemist. This has 13 different botanicals. It's Slovenian oak, neutral grain spirit. And one of the cool things about this brand, dude, when I went to this place in the middle of the mountains in the Alps, it's a very small town, but they have tons and tons of product. Where do you think it is? It's in the ground, in the mountain. I went three or four levels down into the ground, into the Alps, into the mountains, like tasting straight out of these casks. It was, un it was unbelievable. They just dug into a mountain? They dug straight into a mountain down so that they could, so they could put more casks oh, in the mountain. I, I just was asking, that sounds awesome. They dug deep into the ground. Yeah, no. And so like, so, so it really took over the town, but under the streets. So you're literally under the streets of Borneo, it's called, is the town. Okay, so that was that was that one. Okay, so now let's do number one in Amari. Very different, right? The nose is completely different. More cocoa. Mild. 
Mild, mild in the nose, right? But you do get a little juniper, maybe a little pepper, a little grapefruit. Some vanilla, right? Vanilla, big time. Who said vanilla? I get it. Let's take two sips. <laughs> Anybody have an idea? Nice work, guys. So the reason why I showed these two is Raulio is from the north. Those are mountain herbs. You got wormwood, gentian, you got uh, those balsamic style mountain herbs. And then Averna is from the south. So you're getting a little bit more citrus. Um, I couldn't find how many botanicals were in Averna. Does anybody here work for Averna? <laughs> There's at least two, right? <laughs> it's also neutral grain spirit. It's made the same way. It goes as far back as the monks who handed it over to, uh, to the, the gentleman, the, 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 the Salvatore Averna, who was a benefactor of the monastery to help you know, fix some of the broken pieces of the monastery. But in my opinion, and also that guy that I met in Italy, he thinks that he changed the recipe because the monks were typically more medicinal style and they also aged in oak and I don't think Averna does. So I think certain things, th certain things changed back then when he took over the recipe. One of my favorites though, I mean, I mean back in the 90s, back in the early 2000s as a nightclub bartender, that was one of the, me and Tim Cooper in New York, we used to rip Averna. Oops. Okay. <laughs> What's that one? All right, so number one under Crowder. <laughs> Sorry, I'm working two computers. What do you get on the nose? The one mistake I have comes at the most important time. <laughs> the nose here? I think big white pepper. Almost barnyardy white pepper. I get anise too, but it's anise and white pepper to me. Some floral. You're definitely getting clove and cinnamon. I mean, cinnamon and clove are huge here, right? So this is, as you know, I'll just bring it up. This is Underberg. This is also a Krauter from Germany, 44%, uh, pure neutral grain spirit, uh, based on a, an old family recipe. This again, why I'm showing this is because it's from Germany, it's a Krauter, it's also family owned. Um, this, is, this, isn't served in a, this isn't served in a big bottle, it comes in the little bottle, as you guys know. Um, somehow they, they, they are conceived in this country as a non-potable or a food additive, so it can be sold in any supermarket or anything like that. Um, that would be the difference and why. Um, but at the end of the day, it's pretty darn good. So. Do they sell Underberg in anything other than that? No. <laughs> years and years and years ago, historically, it did, right? So um, it, it's based off an old Bunakamp recipe from Holland. And in the like late 1700s, that kind of thing, um, it was sold in bigger bottles. But then the family ultimately made a decision to start serving them in little bottles. Is the Brazilian version that's in a larger bottle? It's not really the same color. It's an underberg? I don't know. I don't know. Were the caps in bigger bottles? No idea. I would love to go back in time though. Live during that age. I want the belt. <laughs> Alright guys. I know that thank you. First of all, thank you guys very much for staying after. I appreciate you. This is this was this is a lot and I know it's the last one, so we have a couple more minutes if you want to stay, if you guys have to leave, go, but if you're going to stick around, let's let's just finish this up here, okay? So the last one, as we know, 
And by the way, new bottle coming out, if you haven't seen it yet. This is Jägermeister, ladies and gentlemen. This, uh, the company started in 1878. The company started in 1878. Jägermeister was created in 1934 by Mr. Kurt Mast. His father, Willem Mast, was the owner of the company. It was a wine and vinegar company at the beginning. Uh, Kurt, the son, uh, ultimately uh, wanted to go in a different direction. He was in love with um, you know, herbal, herbal liqueurs and, and the history of and, like, everything that we kind of went through to, to kind of set the stage. Um, and ultimately, this was created um, you know, uh, as a celebratory shock moment, man. I mean, this was, to, this was to cheers the hunter, right? So Jägermeister, everybody knows Jägermeister means master hunter. The term Jägermeister is an actual title of a person's position. In, in the US, it would be like the game warden, right? So that's what a Jägermeister is. Um, but in actuality, this brand was based off of a 30%, 30 of this brand is based off of a Punicop recipe, as well as um, the, the pharmacist that was in Wolfenbuttel was a very dear friend of Kurt Mast. So those two together, um, in the early 1900s, early 1900s, created this recipe, and it's been the same ever since. So um, let's taste it. How, how, how many here by show of hands has it been since you've tasted Jägermeister? <laughs> uh, nice, uh, man! Uh, so I don't ask uh, me. Nice! We've been doing our job! Yesterday. Okay, my other question, hold on. My other question. How long, uh, how many by show of hands is this the first time you've tasted Jägermeister room temperature? <laughs> nice! <laughs> Okay, listen, I just have to put this out there. Gangermeister will always be, the, the number one thing of our company is that ice cold shot moment. But when it comes to people like us, people that are on the front lines in craft, people in image accounts, that kind of thing, it's all about the cocktail, how you use it. It's about room temperature. It's about tasting everything that goes in there. But at the end of the day, our company 100% is freezing cold, ice cold shots. So hang on, if we're late night and we got a machine near us, we're gonna out. But you know, that 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 is what it is. But I want you guys to taste and understand that Jägermeister has authenticity, it has provenance, it's German, it's Krauter liquor, and it can be used, tasted, served in any way, shape, or form that you guys see do fit for where and what you guys do. So let's nose and taste and you guys give me a little bit of feedback. It tastes like candy after that, I don't know. Nice <laughs> Willie, I know it's a bit dated. Who can you tell us about the uh, wine and vinegars that they were doing prior? That's kind of cool. Really yeah, it was um, great. Why not? I, I, great. I have to get back to you on that one because that's part of some of the research that, that I'm doing. And um, that and also the pharmacist in which Kurt was working with. Is that, was that great vinegar? I think if it was wine, if I was to if I was to if I was to, if I was to guess, it was if I was to guess. <laughs> yes. I can't. Okay, give me an educated guess. If you're doing wine, I would assume that that would be great. Yeah, it would probably be. It would probably be great. What is balsamic vinegar made from? Great, great, great. So it must be, it must be great. I mean, Germany is a huge, you know, wine country. So most likely it was. I can't, I can't give you an honest answer, so I'd rather not. Okay, cool. Is Wolfenbüttel in the south or the north? Wolfenbüttel is pretty much right center stage on the mic where it comes to if you, if you, if you see the map of Germany, it's right center. It's about, a, it's about an hour and a half from Berlin, a train ride. Uh, it's farm country. Is it near Bavaria or no? Bavaria is way down south, like Munich. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Hey guys. A few minutes, few minutes. Oh, wow. Stay where you're at. Nobody leave. Stay here, stay here. Anybody who's volunteer has to stay here. And everybody's volunteering to listen to me more, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, did everybody taste and smell Jägermeister? I didn't get any. Who didn't get any? Give her a bottle. <laughs> okay, so Jägermeister, stay, bear with me guys, stay with me. Hey, bear with me, stay with me. Jägermeister taste is complex, mildly spicy, right? Traces of citrus, ginger, orange, star anise, and coffee. Jäger loves coffee, FYI. Nice clean finish. Pure and natural taste bears with a solid, strong character. 
So does, does it stay with you super sweet? For me, it dries out. It's bitter and it dries out. It's 140 grams per liter of sugar. It's not over the top when it comes to a liqueur, so it's very low in the liqueur sugar content category, in my opinion. That's just talking, you know. Here are 11 spices that go into uh, Jägermeister. We have cardamom, bitter orange peels, mace. Everybody know what mace is? Nutmeg, case of nutmeg, ginger, chiretta, cinnamon, cloves, galingal. Everybody know what galingal is? Galingal is like a cousin to ginger, but more floral, turkey, fruity, spicy. Uh, star anise, licorice. These are all, that's the 11 we talk about in this country. And then, real quick, and then you're done. We'll just go through this. <clears throat> Process. Everything about Jägermeister, which translated Master Hunter as the German herbal liqueur, founded by Willem Mass in 1878. In 1934, Kurt, Kurt Mass christened the new liquor with his base solely as natural ingredients, the Jägermeister. It was developed for and dedicated to hunters, as we talked about. Its unmistakable taste is made from a secret recipe by its 56 different herbs, spice, roots, flowers, and blossoms around the world. They are milled and weighed and put into four separate macerates of bitter, aromatic, citrus, and floral for 30 days, as we talked about. The macerates are then combined together. The macerates mature in mighty German oak casks, 3,000 to 22,000 liters for nearly one year, where it's given time to breathe. To protect the unique taste of the Jägermeister, the bottle had to be absolutely dependable. Our founder, Kurt Mass, tested hundreds of different shapes by dropping them from great height onto an oak floor. Literally, if you drop a Jägermeister bottle, the thing does not break. It is like, you know, you gotta shoot the thing. Jägermeister undergoes 383 quality checks over the course of the production of the process. The Jägermeister taste is complex, spicy, and soul warming. And we'll just keep going. Above all, of, above all, you will find a pure and natural taste, a taste of true and genuine character. Jägermeister, to this day, remains a family-owned company in Wolfenbüttel, Germany, which is very important. Today, Jägermeister has undoubtedly become Germany's most famous drink export. Every day, someone in Germany or across the world discovers the taste of Jägermeister for their very first time. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Shots go across the bar. I want to beat that tonight. We have a happy hour this evening starting at now. <laughs> Hi, until 6 30. We'll see you there. Thank you very much for your time. Everybody Let's hear it for Willie. Much love to all of you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Everybody